celebrity style inspiration. Hi, CSIers! Welcome back to your favorite Thursday date night here at the Manila Times CSI Celebrity Style Inspiration. Ako po si Tessa Mauricio Ariola, and you're watching our fourth and biggest season ever, where we've lined up exclusive teaser and interviews with your favorite celebrities and personalities week after week after week. So let's get started right now. We're truly making the most of technology tonight as we bring you the Manila Time CSI from three different time zones. And yet, we'll still be talking about something proudly made in the Philippines that recently made it to different corners of the world, thanks again to technology. To be more accurate though, our topic isn't so much a thing, but creative imaginings come to life. A story that is set in Manila that is real yet magical and gritty yet supernatural. Despite the pandemic, there was still many a moment in this past year and a half where Filipinos everywhere got to hold their heads up high. One of these unfolded on the streaming platform Netflix, where an original and contemporary Filipino comic book came to life in an amazing animated series. So just like Japan's Naruto, the Philippines finally had its own anime character on the world's foremost on-demand entertainment app, a babaylan mandirigma lady detective at that. Tonight, we have with us, all the way from Denmark, the genius Pinoy creative who placed country, culture, and talent on the map of global anime with a plum. Grateful to be able to congratulate and thank him for such a feat, I'm happy that our resident pop culture expert and our much-loved fangirl Karen Kunowitz has agreed to join me tonight all the way from America to help us geek out and most importantly do justice in this interview with an all-new Philippine pride who's in a league of his own. CSIers, please welcome Tresa co-creator Budget Tan. Woo! Oh, yay! Oh that was Hello. a very beautiful that was a very beautifully wow. written introduction i i i love it i loved every word it was very doesn't our guest deserve it kind of don't want to sort of you know not ask the right questions although you know, i'm very curious really about you know budget's background how he started and everything but before that please do greet us all the way from denmark budget the viewers of the manila times at csi Thank you, Tessa. Thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be uh, part of your show. Um, it's always great to be able to share our stories um, with the rest of the world. You know, you guys might be wondering why we're uh, talking to Budget all the way from Denmark. You know, it's, I think it's because he has one of the coolest jobs on earth. Uh -huh. I have to say that and I'm not you know I'm not going to preempt it I'm just going to ask you Roger, what are you doing in Denmark please tell us I work for Lego that's <laughs> my big <new> job <laughs> imagine that what do you do for them I work for the internal ad agency of Lego so I'm one of the creative leads um, so it's essentially the same thing I was doing back in Manila uh, I lead a team to come up with the advertising and the communications campaigns of Lego. Uh, so yes, so we get to play with the toys uh, uh, ahead of everyone else. <laughs> and we come up with, with stories about them. And a Filipino in the lead of, of, of you know, of marketing, advertising, really so many levels. We are so, so proud of you budget of course you know karen is here to ask the uh you know like the cooler questions um i might not be able to ask them in detail but i did watch uh although siguro lang maybe we could start off maybe karen just to ask budget the beginnings of of Jesse. i mean all of a sudden while he was working in the office you know advertising one of the top advertising firms in the philippines and all of a sudden it just came to mind how did Come it happen a long way and i think he's yeah let's let it's a it's a beautiful story and um actually uh um you know uh um, karen is uh i was was witness <laughs> to our uh, beginnings as a comic book group in, in uh, a studio uh, back in the 90s. 
Um, and um, and yeah, I think you know, um, Trece had its uh, what do you call this? The the foundations of what would eventually become Trece had its uh, starting points uh, because of um, what do you call this? Uh, Karen being part of of Alamat and Karen inviting us to all of those many nights in Club Dread and uh, meeting up with Hank in Malate. <laughs> um, so as you know, the, you know, if Batman has the Batcave and the Justice League has the Hall of Justice, Trece has the Diabolical. Um, and that's her base of operations. And that was hugely inspired by, yes, the many nights we would spend uh, going to Club Dread or Mayricks or 70s Bistro uh, and going the verb. to- The Verve. The Verve. Of course, Verve in Malate, uh, and the other bars in Malate, for that matter. I mean, that's what that's the the vibe that we were trying to put into Trece. Um, so that's one ingredient of, of Trece, right? <clears throat> and again, hanging out with uh, you know the people from the bands, and again with Karen and Hank. We, there were all of these stories that just sounded like impossible that it really happened, but. Uh, and of course, we can't help but talk about magic and witchcraft, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and 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 Dungeons and Dragons and uh, <laughs> Vampire the Masquerade uh, role playing. Uh, again, more ingredients that came into, into play for Trece. Um But yeah, so so yeah, it's really hard to like pinpoint that one linear storyline <laughs> where Trece started, right? But I guess it comes from a love. Uh, me and Kajo are like big fans of Batman. Uh, where we were, were big fans of Ghost in the Shell, who is, you know, also features an investigator with Major Kusanagi. But in her case, she investigates cybercrime, right? You know, crimes committed by cyborgs and AIs and androids. Um, and um, uh, me and Kajo met back in the early 90s. He was in virtual media studios. I was with another group of comic book creators, but we would always meet up and hang out. So that's how I got to know Kajo. And eventually, when I got into advertising and I needed an artist for a project, Kajo was one of the guys I would call up because I knew he would you know, deliver on time and deliver great work. Funnily enough, Kajo eventually ends up working in the same ad agency I was. So he was in the mother company, McCann, McCann Erickson, and I was in Harrison Communications. So we were actually like a couple of buildings apart. Um, and then in 2005, that's when Kajo sent me a text message. And you know, this, he was busy doing Coca-Cola. I was busy doing Globe. And when you have those accounts, it means you o OT is your life, right? Overtime is your life, right? Mm -hmm. you, you always have, you're rushing a project that was needed yesterday and client still has revisions for your project. So by that time, by 2005, you know, I was not doing much comic books by that time. Uh, but Kajo, out of the blue, sends me a text message. And he says, Budge, do you want to do a comic book? He said, do you want to do a monthly comic book? And I said, Kajo, we, that's impossible. We can't possibly do a comic book with our, you know, work life. There is no work-life balance. There's just work <laughs> that is life. <laughs> Um, that's our life. Work is our life. But Kajo said, he said, no, I have a plan. If you can give me a 20-page comic book, I can finish it in 20 days. And he said he was going to devote one hour of his day to just drawing that one page. Right? It didn't matter if it was, you know, to best as best as he could, he would draw one page a day in that given hour. So I wanted to test it. So I dug up an old script. So I had an old script for, uh, again, you know, the, uh, because we love Batman and, and paranormal investigators like John Constantine and Hellboy, I had an old character named Anton Trece. You know, tough guy, wears a leather jacket, carries a buntot pagi, and he like fights monsters. You know, he fights Aswang and all of these other creatures. Um, so I dug up that old script, which I could never finish. And I sent Kajo one page. And true enough, in one hour, he sends back the page to me. He, he, he drew it in an hour. 
And I was looking at this drawing, which was, wow, this is so cool. But something clicked in the back of my head, which made me think, why do it? Why does it feel like we've seen this guy before? Mm -hmm. Tough guy with a leather jacket carrying ancient magical weapon. We've seen it too many times, right? And that's when I just texted Kajo back. So yes, the text and pa no. Wala pang Facebook mo. At least you be deeper. Without not show your age. Okay, okay, back to your story. Um, and I texted back and I said, what if we make Trese a woman? And he quickly texted back, oh, that would make her more badass. And in the same day, he, he emails me a sketch of what would eventually become Alexandra Trese. And, you know, we, we never changed it. We never changed that design. Um, and, and, uh, and I finished that script, which I could never finish. And the first script was the death of the white lady. Mm -hmm. um, and I sent it to Kajo and he finished it in 20 days and after he sent me the 20th page he said okay where's your next script send me the next script um, and I started to make a list I started to make a list of all of the creature of all our urban legends and our creatures from Philippine folklore um, that I wanted Trese to investigate Mm -hmm. That's really it. I mean, the the very essence of Trese is I wanted to revisit the stories that scared us as kids, but now look at it from the point of view of a detective story. Um, and we just kept going from there. It's amazing on so many levels. But the first is that, you know, I love the way that you and your co-creator, actually because you needed to sort of have that life work balance and have the life and not just all the work and you know it's 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 a lesson for all of us to you know to take in that you know you always say you don't have time for anything until you actually make the time for it and look where it led them the bad bridge and just, you know and I, my question before i pass it totally to you karen did you ever get like you know while they were putting it together meron bang mga parang um you know like uh snippets that you got to see while they were developing it Do um i i knew that they were developing it but um i just didn't see it all until the first issue and it's such a it's such an inspiration to i think all the up, up and coming creators because they started again this was the staple uh, bond paper and photocopied mm -hmm. um they didn't get from from the the concept or the germ to suddenly uh books in the us and suddenly netflix it was very slow and and you started where any creator can start anyone can can staple um uh bond paper together with with their story i mean any any it just shows anyone can do it anyone can do it and um and i i really think at the start it was just for the love of these guys are storytellers they just they speculate when you sit and uh, have coffee with them and you're sitting down with them they, they speculate like uh what if you know of course what if is, is a is a popular marvel uh show at the moment i mean just finished i think wrapped up um but that's what they do they go what if like what if this what if that what if there's an ungod instead of creating he takes away little bits and you're just sitting there listening to these guys uh a talk and and it's just it's just pure love pure love for for the imagination, pure love for making, um, you know, uh, like a love letter to Manila, which is not always not easy to love, but <laughs> the reaction that the fans had looking at the the MRT or I know that street, that's De La Rosa, that's you know, it's not pretty, but it's home yeah. Yeah. and you love it and it has character. And you know, I mean, it's really for the love, and that's I mean, that's really why we love having Karen to budget because she, everything that she does is really out of love for something. It's if she's passionate about it, she doesn't care if it's a trend or whatever. But you know, she says it, and as she is now, really so passionate. Just one real question: When they turned the hero into a a girl, 
what was your reaction and then from there you can ask the questions because i just want to know how it you know superwoman my question from a superwoman to another superwoman <laughs> <laughs> my my reaction when you learned that it was going to be a girl you know in the middle um, of the entire story i i really think it was just such a fit i don't know um the i guess creators will always say like sometimes characters just appear yeah they make like the muse gives you a little gift and uh i don't know i think it's it's just a very inspired it just it works it fits and she's incredibly loved uh she's cosplayed uh mm. she's you know she's idol she's cool Mm-hmm. She's cool, and her people love her gang. They love her. I mean, they love her. Her barcada. They love the kambal. Uh, Hank constantly gets questions um, about his characters, and he's asked to chime. The same as bu- budget shepherds his fans on the Tresse page on Facebook, which has thousands. And um, it's a very lively group, and yeah, they 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 love her gang, and it's just. I don't know. Some kind of magic also got in there. I'm Yeah, I, it's just you know, I think I just want to sort of give you the two of you the floor and sort of just think that we're here and we're listening but imagine that you're back in Malate and back in you uh, know, back at Club Dread the were And just talk about it. I mean, you probably haven't seen each other for some time, and this whole huge Netflix thing comes through. I'm sure you've got so many questions uh, for budget. Karen, take it away. This is your this is your day. Okay. Could you talk to us about um, because I mentioned shepherding the fans, and uh, budget is that kind of creator that will give time to. Uh, You give time to your fans. You are on your visits to the Philippines pre-pandemic, and ideally these visits are for family. But you will always make time to meet up uh, with your fans or or set up an event. So, what has it? I mean, how has the fan base grown, and how would you describe them now? From your little, from your visitors to the little booth back in, you know, <laughs> in the mid 2000s to the advent of Facebook and and Facebook groups. Yeah, it it still uh, amazes me and Kadro at how, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, loyal and enthusiastic and creative uh, our reader base is. Um, you know whether it's coming up with memes uh, to make fun of certain characters and situations, making their own artwork, writing their own fan fiction, and of course cosplaying uh, the characters as well in such intricate detail, uh, just just you know blows us away. Um, when we started Trese, I think one of the the first, probably the one who came to our booth and met with us is uh, Professor Maika. Uh, you know, she was a teacher in UP and she oh, loves... Yes. Uh, cosplay. And she cosplayed it. She was like, you know, it was so strange that she comes to our table dressed in the coat and she had the, the sinag um, and she was, you know, asking for her book to be signed. You know, and through the years, we've kept in touch uh, because she's written a lot of papers about um, Trese. Um, there was this back when we were still doing the Comic Con at Bahay ng Alumni. One of my favorite encounters with the reader was this guy comes up to me and he's you know taller than me, and he comes up to me and he said, "I hate you. You you made me cry." And turns and he was referring to one of the stories from Preste that he read, and he said he loved it so much he just ended up crying uh, after reading that story. Uh, and and had had the book you know signed and and again you know with with Facebook what we found so interesting were the years in between what was that in between um, six and seven right or between four and five 
there were uh, there was a there was that time period when me and Kaj, you know, life took over. <laughs> life took over, and me and Kajo couldn't produce the the stories in time. But I do feel it was the readers that kept it alive. They kept the discussions ongoing. Uh, and yes, every now and again, someone would step over the line, and that's when, you know, I just give a, a nice, friendly reminder. Uh, to the readers, I paint a picture that whenever they enter the Facebook page, they are entering the diabolical. They are entering the bar. And you should conduct yourself in the same way when you enter a bar, right? You you don't just go up again, you know, you don't go up to the bar and start yelling at someone, you know, uh, disagreeing with their point of view. You don't do that, right? Uh, and, and somehow, when everyone has a drink, usually uh, the conversations flow. And yes, there will be one guy that will get drunk and start, you know, uh, yelling and speaking his mind too much. And that's when you call in the bouncers to get that guy out of there. But I think, you know, the, the, it's great how the readers um, self-police the group. Uh, and, you know, and usually by the time I, I, you know, log in and check out what's happening, they would have already put things under control. <laughs> I just wanted to know how it goes, but after, you know, uh, piecing all the uh, band paper together with the staplers, as Karen really, really wonderfully sort of um, gave us that, that really great picture, how does it get published and then how does it go from there to Netflix? I just, you know, just maybe to inspire other creators. I was just asking Karen, I mean, from the staple pieces of bond paper, how it went, you know, and got published and then how long till it got to Netflix just to inspire so many other creators out there that I'm sure would really love to be able to do even just half of what you've accomplished. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll talk about the publishing journey of, of Trece. Um, so yes, it was, um, again, two th um, I guess a little background before 2005 when me and my friends started our own comic book group and we became part and co-founded uh, Alamat, we were self-publishing uh, books that had a print run of normally, normally like a thousand copies, um, which might sound small, but that's a lot, you know, for, uh, for, for a title or characters that no one's ever heard of. It is the most difficult thing to sell. Right. Sometimes we'd print a thousand copies, and the, the we'd sell a hundred copies, and the nine hundred becomes like you know part of the furniture in the house. <laughs> right. So I I went through that for like what uh, three four different titles. Yeah. Um, some were co-funded, some I funded by myself or the first one, and uh, so I didn't want to repeat the that. I didn't want to be burdened with. Uh, needing to worry about how do I sell a thousand copies. So that's why when Kajo said, let's make a comic book, I said, okay, but let's not print a thousand copies. I said, because I don't think we'll ever sell a thousand copies, is what I told him. Uh, so we printed like 50 copies, <laughs> I think, of, uh, at the beginning. You know, half of which went to friends and family. Half we sold because we we uh, a friend of ours was managing Comic Quest Comic Quest in Mega Mall, so we we just went to him and said, oh, can I can I sell you know these Xerox comic books? And he said yes. Um, and that was that was stressful for the first two years, roughly. Um, we had gotten to the point when we had seven uh, issues. So each issue is 20 pages and it's, you know, photocopied and stapled. Uh, and we would sell it in, uh, yeah, Comic Quest. Uh, and then that uh, uh, 2005 was the same time Comic Con started in the Philippines. So then there was a yearly venue for us to, you know, uh, distribute stuff. Um, we pitched it to... I think we pitched it to two other publishing companies at the time and for whatever reason they didn't uh, accept it and uh, it didn't push through, simply put. And they must be pitching themselves right now. Can you <laughs> I, I don't know if they still remember me pitching to them. 
Um, but then we we found out through a friend about a company called Visprint. And Visprint is of course the publisher of uh, Kiko Machine by Manix Abrera, Carlo Vergara's um, Jaja Zaturna. Um, and at that time, they published David Hontiveros' uh, Penumbra horror novels. So it was like three novels of different types of horror. So to me, looking at a publisher that took a risk and was, you know, putting the spotlight on a comic strip, uh, a gay superhero, and a horror uh, line, no one was doing that at the time, right? So I took a chance and I thought if this publisher is willing to take a risk with new voices, with new creators, maybe they'll like Trece. Um, and to make a long story short, it was like probably a year in discussion uh, with them, but we got published by, we got accepted and published by Visprint. And that I think was the biggest break we could possibly get because suddenly it came in book format. So that was one of the things we discussed um, to release it instead of releasing it like a, like a regular comic book, we release it in book format which got us into bookstores, which got us on bookshelves, which sounds, you know, duh, of course it ended up there. But the interesting thing was that the moment we were on the bookshelves, people started to accidentally find us. We had so many stories on our first year of people saying, ah, nagpunta po ako ng national bookstore, hinahanap ko yung Pugad Baboy, <laughs> pero nakita ko yung comics nyo. You know? <laughs> They saw the book and they flipped it. They flipped over here. What is this? You know, um, and that's how and that's how we got our first batch of readers. We started to promote ourselves on Yahoo mailing groups, on Pinoy Exchange. I don't know if you were ever on Pinoy Exchange, uh, on other you know message boards, on Multiply, because Facebook was just coming in by then. Um, so yeah, we did use technology as much as we could. Uh, and then yes, there were the events. Um, and yeah, Visprint has been very supportive and kind to us that we, they're, they're not the type of publisher that says, okay, you need to release it every year. You need to, you know, it, it, it was more of like, when, when are you going to release this? <laughs> and so they gave us time and space to really create uh, but every time we would release it, um, we they would you know give a lot of support in promoting uh, the books. Um, and then um, okay, so now that we have books, we started to pitch it to publishers abroad, and we've gotten rejected or ignored by a lot of the big companies and even small companies. Um, it was 2018 when we sent another package to another publisher and we got a very nice rejection letter. <laughs> so I told Kajo, Kaj, we got rejected again. And then Kajo sends me a message and says, Budge, I think the reason why they're not uh, getting, we're not getting accepted by the foreign publishers is the artwork. He said, I want to redraw the first issue of Trece. Mm -hmm. And at that time we were doing issue seven and I said, can you do both? And I said, do you really want to redraw issue the first issue when we could be spending our time and energy on book seven? And he said, yes, I really think if I redraw book one, we'd get we'd find the foreign publisher. And then he came up with a plan. And again, it's God's over the plan, right? He said he started to look into Kickstarter. And he said, can we try Kickstarter? We ended up in Indiegogo because Kickstarter doesn't allow projects from outside North America. Indiegogo allows projects from all over the world. So he started to redraw the pages and we made those original pages the, what do you call this, the perk. If you support our project on Indiegogo at this, and you give this much support to it, you get an original page from Kato, right? So we started to, uh, that was like what, September? We started in September, the deadline was November. So we had three months to try and get as much money to print and distribute the book. 
two things happened that allowed us to reach our target. The first one was somebody, a Filipino, tweeted Neil Gaiman and said, Dear Neil, aren't you ever going to write about Filipino mythology? And Neil Gaiman said, I think you have, uh, it, it's a territory that he doesn't want to get into. I mean, that he's not, you know, overly familiar with, even though he's visited us, you know, how many times. But he said, you have more uh, talented creators who can write better stories than I can, was what Neil Gaiman said, right? So when he said that, um, I tweeted him back and I said, dear Neil, um, we are promoting a project on Indiegogo about Philippine mythology. Can you take a look at it? And he retweets that. And when he retweeted that, that's like we, we meet our target, right? We, we meet our target. In November of 2018, Netflix then announces their lineup of new shows. And they had, they showed one slide, which was, and from the Philippines, Trece. And that just allowed us to like overshoot our, our mm. target. What a story. <laughs> and, and then because of that announcement, a company in America called The Blaze saw the news announcement and contacted us. And they said, hi, we're A Blaze. We're a new comic book company and we are specializing in comic books from outside of the United States. So they were publishing, reprinting European, Japanese, Korean comic books. Mm -hmm. And they saw Trese and they saw Kajo's new art in Trese. And they said, do you want to become part of our editorial lineup? Um, and we said, yes. Okay. So now Trese is distributed globally through Ablaze. Last month, the Italian edition just came out. Oh. A couple of months, another foreign edition will be coming out, which we'll announce when it's official. There's more to geek out here on the Manila Times CSI, but we have to pause for a quick break and we'll be right back. CSI, celebrity style inspiration. Going off on the uh, uh, discussion we had on your fans, your fan base, your little section of the diabolical on Facebook. Um, I know there's a certain level of fame where everyone is supportive, everyone's talking about you, and there's another level of fame when the trolls come in and the, you know, the very, very, I mean, the critics who are harsh that they're not constructive, you know, they're, uh, sorry, uh, bleep, 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 curse, curse, curse. Okay, so <laughs> that's the way they, they talk about your work. Um, how do you think your fan group um, has helped you deal with, you know, this, I, I'm, you know, you've, you've shared some of those that, that, that have come in. Um, how do you think they've, they've helped you when, when this sort of negativity uh, from the internet, from strangers coming in your PM. I mean, it's, I, I imagine at the start, it, you know, this is my baby. It, it hurts for you to, to um, say these things and to, you know, minumura ninyo yung trabaho ko versus like someone who's maybe constructive and saying, oh, you know, um, I think you should never ever take the gods out of a nature situation. Why are you, you know, they, they, they would, you know, things like that where they have very valid, you know, like, not valid points, but they're, um, you know, they try to explain their thinking behind why they didn't like something and you understand it versus someone who's just being just, upset and angry yeah. and would just like, just to make you have a bad day. So could you talk about that, that aspect of, um, that aspect of, I guess, fame? Yeah, it, it's, um, um, th that, I guess that's the big difference between uh, uh, pre-anime and post-anime. Um, that that now we've got more, uh, we've got the attention of more people, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, and and there are new people to the group that, of course, um, have a lot of questions uh, that the that you know the the rest of the readers have had the benefit of like what ten years of reading the books. 
of reading and rereading the books, right? So the new readers have all of these questions. And yes, you can, I guess it cannot be helped that since people see Trece as a hero, as a protector, as a defender, that they would use her image in artwork related to, yeah, what, you know, related to politics, right? Related to what's happening in the Philippines. And now the election is coming up, right? So they can't uh, help but, so for, for me, on one side, it's, it feels, um, it feels good to know that that's how they see Tres, right? And that's why they would make these um, drawings and illustrations about her fighting, you know, corrupt politicians. Um, but at the same time, of course, um, there are people who who feel otherwise, right? Who 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 support uh, the the politicians that are being depicted as as the aswang, <laughs> right? So, so that's where the argument starts. And for me, it's like, if we can keep the discussion healthy, I'll keep it going. But if it just comes down to mudslinging and it's not healthy anymore, then then I take down the post or I stop the comments. I close the, I, you know, you can shut down people from commenting just so that people can read, right? And just so that they know this discussion happened, you can read about it, but we're putting a stop to people talking about it because people are getting emotional. Um, but it just goes to show the power of comics for me. Um, and and again, you know, I when when I show um, the the stuff happening in Trese, I am depicting what I read in the newspapers. Yeah, I'm. I'm echoing stuff I heard from friends and family of things that happened to them, right? Um, and it's uh, it doesn't necessarily always mean that uh, this is my political stand, right? If I have my own personal page to do that, Trece is a vehicle for stories. And it just so happens it is a crime story. So it is a noir. So therefore, in a, in a, in a crime noir story, we will always have the corrupt politician. I, yeah, I, that's an archetype. That's yeah. I think that's an archetype that's pretty standard. Yeah, almost so, anywhere you are, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, so it so they will always so they will take many shapes and forms in the Trece comic book. But every now and again, yes, sometimes the politician is more ruthless than the Aswan. You know that that's that's what will happen. You know, the, obviously, you know, the, the fan base, they're so active, so into it, so involved in all that. But, you know, as you were saying, of course, Netflix reached um, so many other countries. And then, um, you know, you've got um, translated um, comic books in so many different countries. Do they also get into that same Facebook fan page and join in the conversations? I mean, what, the fan base uh, outside the Philippines. Tell us a bit about that, how it's grown. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's a good question. I haven't seen a lot of foreigners come into the uh, into the reader group. So there are two Trese pages. One is um, just it's it just talks about the comic book, and of course it's um, it's more of like an announcement page, right? And people can comment. But in the community page, in the group page, that's where people can make their own posts and things like that. Um, so I probably see more foreigners react to the, the comic book page rather than the reader page. Um, but yes, we have, I mean, through private messages, we've gotten feedback as well from an Instagram, I think is the other place that suddenly, where I suddenly discovered, oh, people can send me messages on Instagram. There's an entire, you know, folder there of, of um, people that are not my contacts and they're they're sending me messages um but yeah it's it's a um, it's a uh, and the other thing where we have gotten the most i don't know active uh reaction is youtube um you have these comic they have these anime reviewers and comic book reviewers who watch the show and then they would make an episode or sometimes they would just make a reaction video mm -hmm. so 
watching the episode real time and you're just seeing them you know react and comment about it um so yeah it ranges from it's so great to see uh all of these foreigners react to uh, the the common thing is like you know everyone loves the kambal they find them so yes adorable everyone's falling in love with maliksi the the aswang prince who doesn't know how to wear a shirt also uh -oh. a... <laughs> yes <laughs> and echo and it's not uh -oh, uh -oh, uh -oh. Why, why is that your fashion statement? I don't know. Um, and again, yes, to even serious topics like uh, reviewers saying, oh, oh, they also have police brutality. Oh, they also have corrupt politicians. And and suddenly that's a, a way for them to connect to, to, to us, to, to what we're living over here. And then, yes, this whole... Uh, for them, it's just eye-opening to learn a new mythology and all of these uh, details of our folklore. Karen, I just want to ask, um, you know, your columns, obviously, uh, when we read them, we do really, you know, you, you say it for us that it's been a difficult time and that we, we really need sometimes to have that sort of escape. When it comes to comics, books like you know i mean trese and, and especially let's let's zoom in on the filipino comic books what has that done for you all this the past year and a half through this pandemic and um you know what can you tell people because parang diba you marami nang have run out of movies on netflix to watch right. maybe this is something that we should a lot more people should look into you know um there were this was one of the things you know the the release of Tres, and it just it made people very very happy in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. It's it's been tough, and to be able to um, share in the excitement from everything from the dropping of the trailer to the discussions to the the circuit of interviews that you did uh, to the you know release. Um, it was such a highlight, and I think people have you know, started being brave, coming out with their own, uh, lots of kids coming out with their own stories. Um, and people also, you know, going through the catalog of other creators. You know, if, if you go to uh, Secret HQ, that's where Budget had, I think that was your last in-person event with your fans. Um, this place called Secret HQ has a treasure trove of uh, award-winning uh, Filipino comics. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some, there's spillover. There's, uh, it's just done a lot. It's inspired readers to go read the other books. Yeah. And it inspired creators and, you know, uh, I think of Tress as a rising tide, and a rising tide lifts all ship, ships. Mm -hmm. So, um, done so much for, you know, I mean, done so much for Sunny. Yeah, not just for yeah. that title, but all the other titles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people, people were just really excited. They were excited to see the billboard. Um, they were just making all sorts of jokes. I don't know, has Chalk not paid <laughs> giving you gifts because that's pretty much free advertising and for a while walang, I'm sure you've heard na walang chalk nuts uh, you've heard that know. right Tresse came out and then that was the, what they used for <laughs> budget bumibili ako ng chalk nut wala na kasalanan ng Tresse <laughs> yep yeah, yeah people were like showing me photos of them visiting the grocery supposedly mm -hmm. no more chalk nut Oh. I mean, but yeah, going back to what Karen was saying, see, the, the other thing that Secret, H, Secret HQ is run by Paolo Heras, uh, mm -hmm. who is also the organizer of an event called Comiquet, mm -hmm. and he organized the first uh, uh, PICOF, uh, Philippine International uh, Convention, uh, Comic Book Festival, sorry, a comic book festival. So actually this weekend, as we're recording this, he is in the Frankfurt Book Fair. Uh, the books that he that Picoff uh, published. So there was a there was a competition. You pitch your comic book story. If you win, you get published. 
he uh, he has brought those books to the Frankfurt Book Fair, and they are part of the Philippine delegation. So that means uh, book buyers and booksellers from around the world when they go to the Philippine booth, they will see an entire wall of Filipino comic books, uh, which are of course you know if if they do the deals right, then that means these books can potentially get distribution globally and translated as well and again you know reach more readers um so yeah i mean it, it, the 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 good thing is that um people who thought there were no more philippine comic books uh are now taking a second look and are now asking what else can i buy what else can i read uh, which actually has been there all these years for the past 10 15 years uh, hundreds of Philippine comic book creators have been making stuff except yeah you know if you don't uh, if you just make the wrong turn in a in a bookstore you won't see the books That's true. <laughs> you're not looking for them but you've, so, all got, you've all got a fairy goth mother in- <laughs> Because you know, I mean, through these years, we've you know, we we we've formed a following also in the Manila Times because she has really you know given you her support. I mean, I know about the events that you're talking about because she has covered them for us, and it's you know, I mean, I think I think it's great what you've done, and I mean, no wonder you're such a part of their story, and you've got such a place in one of the you know one of the books. Um, you know, the team was looking, and your your name is there. They thank you. And it, it's great. I mean, of course, Deba, we know them to help each other. And you've helped so many. I think that's what's great. I mean, you've cut the, you know, all these, done these shortcuts for them now. You know, they know they know where to go and they, they know what to do. Um, and to think that it all started because you you and Kajo were just looking for life, you know. <laughs> that's so much. That's really, it's such good news that, that our books are, I didn't know that, that our books are going to be and uh, it, the, in Frankfurt. Yes, uh, and the, the, the book. Kind, yeah. mm-hmm. oh, oh, in the kind care of Mr. Paolo O'Heras, who is also a creator himself. Mm. So... <laughs> I, I I didn't know that. That's really, really good news. Where do you see all of this going? I mean, finally, the spotlight is on the cre- these creators. Um, what is the hope? And, and what do you see happening? I, I think um, locally, I hope that we get more support from, from the readers, right? From people who thought um, they've outgrown comics mm-hmm. to people who think that, you know, um, who, who, who just tend to look at, find, try and find uh, entertainment through their screens. Uh, I hope they put down their, you know, devices and, uh, or sorry, use their device, devices to order from Shopee and Lazada. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and I think, sorry, and that's the other thing I have to point out that, um, you know, the effect of the pandemic is that uh, comic book creators and bookstores needed to find ways to reach readers. So suddenly they they created website. They It either ranges from setting up shop in Shopee and Lazada to selling one-on-one on their Instagram and Facebook. And then, and then now you have uh, services like Grab and Lala Moves and all of these other delivery services that allow you to reach readers who probably never bothered to go to Comic Con. Mm-hmm. Readers who thought Comic Con was too far for them to visit. Um, so yeah, exactly. To 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 new and old comic book creators, the opportunity to find more readers is now you know, better compared to what we had a year ago or five years ago. Um, So it really means we need, uh, all creators, writers, artists need to take the time and energy to promote the work, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Sometimes there is this misconception of, I've published the book, it will now sell. It's yeah. important, and that's what you do a lot of. You do, um, it's it's work. I I, I see, but talk to 
uh, so many readers, and I think that makes a difference. That you really, really uh, engage. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, your last event, you really took time to talk to talk to every person. So the last person who promoted was Jay Ignacio. He did uh, because we have such amazing uh, Filipino writers and artists. Na in 2011, there was a comic con panel called specifically the Philippine Invasion, mm-hmm. celebrating uh, Filipino comic book artists. Of which, you know, the U.S. they have a reputation for doing very good art and. The publishers, the reputation is that ang bilis magtrabaho. They, the American publishers get shocked, huh? You can do this much, and and this quality. So, uh, the last one I picked up was a book, um, by Jay Ignacio with the art of Alex Nino, yes. who is in his seventies. Do I have it correct? He's in his seventies oh. and. Uh, He's a, he's a he's a treasure, but we have so many. We have so many who are, I don't know. Lenil uh, is is still doing. It's just there's so many artists that um, they just send their work to the U.S. Mm-hmm. and uh, you know they're mm-hmm. they're appreciated. It goes, it goes to show that we that that question always comes up. Do we have what it takes to? Uh, um, you know, penetrate the global market, and the the answer has been yes since the 70s. Yes, right. Yes, really about you know they're not we're not getting enough support uh, locally, and um, and you just need to work harder. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, the mere fact that we have a, or how many uh, a dozen or more. Filipino comic book artists now working for U.S. Uh, comic book companies. There's even one Filipino who has now moved to France because he is there. He is an in-house artist for one of the graphic uh, novels in in France. So you know uh, we do have the talent. Um, yep. Except the uh, it really requires. Um, what do you call this? Uh, support from publishers and bookstores yeah. to devote time and space for mm-hmm. works. Uh, and if we do that, then you know, I think we'll uh, we we we, we uh, the world will start looking for more. At the very least, you know, I was about to say we're gonna beat Japan. I don't I don't think. <laughs> but you we know, never know if it's going to push us that direction, but. You know, I mean, earlier on, um, you know, when I introduced you, I said that, that, you know, I really wanted the opportunity to be able to thank you. I think, Karen, right, to thank you on behalf of an, a nation that, that really needed that boost. I mean, that amazement that like, wow, he's he's Filipino and he's on Netflix. And, and at a time when we really needed it most, thank you for that. Thank you for bringing our culture um, out there. And... You know, I don't know what the technology will be in years to come, but you know, um, you know, Karen, you were saying that the seventy-year-old um, artist is a treasure. Yeah, Nina is a treasure, and you know, I'm just going to say it. You know, I hope you know when people look back in YouTube um, in years to come, we said it here that you know the roles of national artists are you know getting Filipino culture out there. You know, talent. Um, you know, and, and 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 promoting it internationally, and you know, like bringing that all that back to the Philippines, and you know, maybe in ten years we'll be, you know, maybe if we still have a show, Karen, then we'll 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 come and ask budget to come, and maybe we'll be introducing a national artist. You know, wish we could give you guys a hug, but you know, we're so far away thanks to technology. We've been brought together, but we will look forward to seeing more of your work. Mr. Budget Tan, and of course, at tomorrow night, Fangirl, of course, will give us her usual, uh, you know, review for the weekend, um, movie review. She she comes on every Friday. Now we have three nights a week for the Manila Times CSI, and and Karen's um, always been great giving our viewers, uh, you know. Salamat ako, maraming salamat. 
Bye bye, guys. Thank you so much. And that's it for this episode of the Manila Times CSI Season Four. Once again, thank you very much to Budget Tan for raising our Filipino flag in Denmark, and of course through Chesse as well as fan girl Karen Kunaritz for joining us tonight. Many thanks too to the Manila Times editor De Fort Villaseran for connecting us with our guest. Don't forget to stream Chesse on Netflix if you haven't yet, and check out the Chesse comic book series at local and online bookstores. Shem Brett, cheers to my hardworking team at the Manila Times CSI, Christina, Isa, Mika, and of course, our director and video editor, Neil Reyes, for getting our humble show out there week after week. All that we do is for you, our beloved CSIers. If you haven't yet, do subscribe to the Manila Times YouTube channel, like our Facebook page, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at TMTCSI. Don't forget to end the week tomorrow with Fangirl to cap your three-day dose of our show. See you next Thursday. This is Tessa Mauricio Ariola, and thanks for watching. Bye! CSIers, please do subscribe to the Manila Times YouTube channel, like our Facebook page, and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at TMT CSI. And by the way, we're also on Spotify with exclusive TMT CSI studio content that's up and ready for you to enjoy. Bye! <laughs>